we are on. Welcome, uh, Sayerville Library. My name is Ken Burkham, and I'm an attorney in Addison, New Jersey, and I'm here to answer your questions about wills, estate, probate, power of attorney. So, just like in school, if you got questions, raise your hand, because rather than having someone just talk for 45 minutes or an hour, I'm sure everyone has questions. Write down your questions. Now, oftentimes people will say, well, I'm married, why do I need to have a, a, a will? Uh, doesn't everything go to my spouse under law? He goes, well, yes, but your, your spouse is not going to live forever. They're not going to live 150 years. Part of doing planning is to make it as easy as possible so that there's less expenses, less aggravation, less work. So I, I, uh, I always say, you know, no one would, no one would uh, say, I'm going to take a vacation on November 1, but wait till October 31st to decide where am I going to go and how am I going to get there? So you want to you want to plan ahead of time. Now, I'd say uh, if, so because if there is no will, generally the process becomes much much more difficult to distribute things. I'd say yeah. Uh, now also if uh, now let's say there's like a uh, let's say there's there's children no spouse. Well, even if there's three kids, even if everyone agree on who should be the administrator, the uh, uh, they all have to agree in writing. Everyone has to sign what's called a renunciation for administrator in front of a notary, got to be filed with the circuit, to have one appointed, appointed, one family member appointed as the administrator. Now, typically, you hope that families work together, but I've had matters where I'd say, yeah, one brother says, I'm not going to sign. I'd say, there's only three kids. Number one lives in Edison, that's where the house is. Number two lives in a, uh, North Carolina, she doesn't want to do it. The one on one side, well, he's in prison in New York. Yeah. So, but he can't be the administrator, so that means that we have to go through this elaborate process of filing a complaint, order shall cause, asking the Superior Court judge to declare um, the, the proper person to be the administrator. So that costs, costs a lot of money. I'd say the family can avoid that. Also, if there is no will, the person who eventually becomes the administrator has to take out what's called a, uh, a bond, a surety bond. It's going to get an insurance policy to show that they won't steal. Now, most people trust who their beneficiaries are, who their executor is going to be. So why spend that extra thousand, two thousand, and that fee is per year? So I got an estate that uh, you know it took two years to wrap up because uh, they were selling an old house, and but so each year we had a meeting. So there's additional cost if there's no will. Um, I'd say yeah. Now, state also state law determines who gets assets, not you. And we're going to go into the program. Many times, people don't leave the assets directly to kids. Uh, well, and uh, an example is sometimes people say, you know what? I'd say yeah. Both of uh, my kids have graduated college. They're working. Um, they have their own house. But eventually, my grandkids eventually will go to, will go to college. And I'd rather put some money uh, towards their college rather than for my son so he can buy a boat, you know, so uh, my daughter can buy a fancy car and some jewelry. You know, and on the other hand, my grandkids are going to finish college with a, uh, a student loan debt of like, you know, $200,000, $300,000 or so. I'd say my son 10 years ago got accepted to this smart kid school called Vanderbilt. Uh, back then, 10 years ago, it was only... $55,000 a year. My son eventually went to the University of Miami. That was only $45,000 a year. But because he was, uh, he, was, he was smart like his grandfather in math, he got like, you know, uh, a partial academic scholarship. Um, now, uh, if, uh, we sometimes do wills for people because if, if they have minor kids uh, and uh, they pass away, I'd say, and the spouse isn't in the picture, or the father isn't in the picture, uh, I would say a stranger in New Brunswick, the judge there, determines who gets custody of, of kids. And I did it for a couple, I didn't have much, but he goes, I want to make sure that uh, if something happens to me and my spouse, my father is going to be the guardian and mother, not, not her family. But the most important, uh, uh, the biggest problem with not having a will, it causes aggravation of fights amongst the family. Let's see. There's no fights usually like on, on Christmas or Mother's Day, you know, when everyone's together. But um, you know, when all of a sudden it comes into money, and a lot of times our problem is not with the the family member. It's usually whoever they're married to. And I met with a fellow today where I said, "Listen, 
we got to, I, I don't know your family at all, it's only you and your brother, but we got to try, is your, I assume your brother's married. He goes, yes. We got to try to keep her out of the picture because she's going to be the one that's going to probably say, when are we getting our money? When are we getting our money? When are we getting our money? Let's see. So when people are grieving, the next thing they shouldn't have to grieve, uh, worry about is um, doing, going through this, like, this probate process. Um, now, let's see. People put things off because, ah, I don't want to do it. No one looks forward. Who looks forward to cleaning up their garage? Nobody. Who looks forward to, oh, I can't wait to clean the basement. I want, I want to rake the leaves. But, you know, once you do it and it's done, okay, good. I'm glad I finally, finally got that done. I didn't really want to do it, but it's there. I'd say, I remember when I used to have parties, there was stuff that, there were boxes and things that I, I would see on the floor every day. Yeah, I got to get around to moving it. And once I knew that people were going to be there in the next 24 hours, all of a sudden there's cleaning and you're, you're doing, you're doing stuff. So, um, so typically, um, now, the, now, New Jersey made probate in a way uh, easier. So, um, typically what happens is the attorney mails you, emails you a short question, I'd say whether that's a will matter or a probate matter. And uh, ask basic questions. Hey, where do you live? Are you married? Um, and then, for example, one of the first things we ask is we're talking about, okay, who's going to be executive one and who's going to be executive number two? Mm -hmm. Let's see. There should never be co executives. There's uh, because there's a reason why there's not two presidents of the United States at the same time and two, uh, and two governors. They've got to be one captain of the ship. And even if they were identical twins and lived together, that creates twice as much work because that means that two people got to go to the surrogate's office, then two people got to sign the listing for the real estate to be sold, two people got to sign the contract, two people got to sign the addendum, two people got to do, do everything. So usually uh, you, you have a number one and, and a number two. And um, uh, also what, you know, sometimes we've been doing uh, updates, not because we're changing who's getting stuff, but uh, you know, one of the fellows I went to college with, uh, you know, his, his wife is ill. And my rule of thumb is if someone can't drive and can't walk up a flight of steps, they, they are not a good choice to be um, the, uh, the executor. Uh, because there's stuff that you gotta do. Not that we're, not that we're against you know, uh, you know, uh, handicapped people or, or older people, they just can't do it. You know, uh, you know, if I, uh, you know, Mr. Mr. M, when I did his w first will, it might have been 2004, and uh, he could he, he had difficulty seeing because of um, what's it, it's an immaculate degeneration. Well, that was 14 years ago. Yeah, he goes, hey, Mr. M, uh, how's how, how's your eyesight now? And he's like, you know, um, so so you have an executive one, an executive two. Now. We used to ask a lot of questions dealing with assets because New Jersey used to have a very, uh, a high estate tax and it started at $675,000. And you know, a lot of estates, if you added the house and other things, it was six seventy-five. dollars So we used to have to do elaborate planning. Well, New Jersey uh, changed it. And now, uh, as of last year, New Jersey did away with the uh, estate tax. I mean, it's just, uh, we don't know what the governor's gonna do now, he could always bring it back, but, so, the, um, the uh, we, we, there is a federal state tax, okay? Okay, but, on C, uh, um, for those two people in the back over there, um, it starts at $11.6 million, and since we know they have $20 million a piece, <laughs> they get taxed, but the, uh, you know, everyone else does not, on C. Um, I'm sorry, what was that number again? Uh, $11.6 million. Yeah. Now, my, my law office is in South Edison, okay? I'm here in, I'm here in Sagamore. Not too many people I know in South Edison or Parlin have $11.7 million. And if they do, they're not going to tell anyone. Let's see. <laughs> because then people are going to be bugging them for money and contributions and stuff like that. I remember they had that big... Lot of a couple of years ago, my wife goes, "Oh, go buy a ticket." He goes, "No," I goes, "I have a, com a comfortable life now. I'm not a multi-millionaire, but I like my life now. If I got all this money, everyone out of the sun will come bothering me, and then if I don't give them money, then they they bad back it. That's why I never want to be would never want to be a politician because all, automatically 40% of the people think that uh, you know like uh, you know you sleep with the devil." <laughs> Um, so, but what do we do ask? We ask, okay, do you have any real estate in New Jersey? Do you have any real estate anywhere else? Because, although a will that's done in New Jersey is valid in any state, uh, 
New Jersey probate is easy. Other states' probate is more complicated. So let me touch, uh, and by the way, if anyone has any questions, like raise your hand, I'll, I'll stop so second. Um, so if you have yeah. property in another state, you have to probate in that state? Uh, yes, it's called ancillary uh, um, probate. So uh, with this type of, uh, so, so for example, my father-in-law owns a condo in Cocoa Beach, Florida. And for probably 11 years, I uh, so by the way, so let me talk, New Jer let me just talk about first New Jersey probate. For New Jersey probate of the will, all you need is the original will, death certificate, check for $150, you meet with the surrogate, they give you the papers, and they say, good luck to you. There's no follow-up, that's, that's typically 99% of the estates. Um, you know, my mother-in-law used to call me uh, every other year and say, I wanna come in and get, get a trust done. And I, would say, I always ask anyone who says, I wanna get a trust, why do you think you need a trust? And I said, were you watching Susie Orman? Yes, I said, she's absolutely right. If you live in Florida, New York, California, you wanna have a trust because their probate process is very, very, very complicated, very complicated. But in New Jersey, you, get, you need the original law, that's to get checked for $150. The people at the circuit's office are very nice. Uh, they can even make the arrangements to meet you at some of the senior centers you know, uh, by appointment. And, uh, you know, so anyone says, I want to have a trust, says, well, why do you think you need a $5,000 trust when a, uh, a $500, $300 will would be just as good? Other than Susie Orman says it's a good idea. Yes, real, sir. Real quick, what yeah. is the difference then? I mean, what is the difference between a will and a trust? Why would well, you spend $10,000? Well, in, in, in other states, see, in other, uh, if, if the property is no longer owned by you, but owned by a trust, let's say, um, if you if you passed away at three o'clock, at four o'clock, your trustee can do every anything and not go to the surrogate's office. So in Florida and California, because probate is very complicated, you want to have you want to put the, you want to have the property not owned by you, but owned by the trust. You know, so that I if someone moves if someone owns a property in Florida, I say listen, it would be a good idea if. You had a trust set up in Florida, have the property owned by the Trust of Florida, because you can't get the veterans or any type of like uh, benefits because you're not a Florida resident. Uh, but this way, your family doesn't have to go through the the whole the whole process. Now, some people set up what's called Medicaid trusts. People are concerned about oh, if I go into a nursing home, you know, where would you know? I don't want my all my assets to be used up for for a nursing home care. So what a Medicaid trust is, that's different from just trying to avoid probate. What a Medicaid trust does is you no longer, no longer own the assets. They have to be retitled and in the name of this uh, irrevocable trust. You can't be the trustee. It has to be someone else. And if they want to not provide for you, they cannot provide for you. Uh, and if five years go by, because uh, Medicaid uh, is a, a five-year look back, then you're eligible for Medicaid. So who pays for nursing home? Uh, well, Medicaid is administered by the Board of Social Services. That's, that's welfare. So either you pay yourself or welfare pays if you don't have any money. Now, one time it's like a daughter brings in mom, uh, dad had passed away, and she goes, oh, uh, you know, uh, mom, mom is very concerned in case she has to go into a nursing home. Daughter was very concerned that she wanted to save her inheritance. And I said, well, you could, uh, you, I said to her daughter, you could take money out of your pocket and pay for long-term, uh, you know, uh, health care, long-term uh, care insurance for your mom if that's what you're concerned about. Well, daughter doesn't really want to pay any money. She just wants to save her, you know, her money. And I goes, um, uh, but then the daughter goes, well, what would I, what would I, he goes, Mr. Cameron, what would you do? He goes, I'm the wrong person to ask. See, I want to go, if I am not ill and not sick, that I can't even get up out of my bed and, you know, uh, go to take a shower, go to the bathroom. For those last, you know, days, weeks, whatever, I want to go into a better facility because I've seen good nursing homes and I've seen disgusting, dirty ones. And this, why did I work so many hours when I was younger? Not so my son, Dr. Brennan, could have a bigger boat. You know, uh, you know, I was always working, you know, since 12 years old, you know, 
raking leaves and shoveling the newspaper route. Uh, you know, I was up at seven o'clock in the morning in the winter delivering newspapers, so so my daughter can buy more jewelry. You know, uh, but I said, you know, I always said, but that's that's me because I remember my grand my grandmother lived to almost one hundred and five, uh, and uh, in the age before cell phones, how do we exist? And I tell my wife, okay, yeah, listen, I'm going to visit my grandmother. She goes, I'll come down and meet you. Okay, it's, uh, it's Fountain View, Route 9. Uh, the race is at 10. I'm bumming a ride off one of my buddies. They're going to drop me off. I'll meet you there. Okay. So my wife's driving down Route 9 in Lakewood. Uh, sees the nursing home on the, on the left, pulls in, and she goes, ew, this is like built. It's all run down and dirty looking. And then she goes in, and the place like, is like dirty. It smells like pee. She goes, oh, I feel so bad for Ken's grandma. I, I knew her. I was... She made, she made us like a uh, dinner. And uh, then my wife asked like uh, the desk for uh, Virginia Burkhan. And they goes, uh, no, no, don't see her. He goes, oh my God, they lost Ken's grandma. <laughs> and, and uh, you know, she goes, oh my God, my, my husband's meeting me here. You know, like, uh, you know, like, uh, that, you know, Fountain View, Route 9. Oh, no, 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 uh, that's down the road. You know, say, uh, you, know, you know, this is Smellyville. Fountain View is a nice new one up the street. But okay, let me go back to uh, uh, the will portion, okay? So, um, um, real estate, do you have real estate here? Do you have real estate anywhere else? Let's see. And, um, you know, and uh, one other thing, I, you know, since we touched upon the Medicaid thing, um, I, Medica uh, I'll call the depression era people aren't going to transfer their assets and do anything. I mean, my father was 93 for 10 years. We said, listen, you should set up a trust and they can be protected and go to your family, avoid probate. No, 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 no. Because listen, I never grew up not having, you know, a piece of bologna for dinner, you know, being a poor person. Um, so I remember my wife uh, going down this year. Just, I'm going to talk to my dad again about doing a trust. He goes, why bother? You know he's not going to do it. It's just going to aggravate you and aggravate him. All right, so our simple question here on the will uh, it says, do you have any real estate? Ballpark, what's the amount? I don't need to know specific details. Just, is it more or less than $11.6 million? But then, um, but then we go into the question, okay, who's gonna be your beneficiaries? Let's say, uh, um, in the, like, uh, the uh, traditional, like, uh, you know, uh, leave it to beaver family, uh, um, it went to the spouse, and to the kids, and to the grandkids. I'd say, uh, but now more and more we have the uh, Brady Bunch type family. It's a second marriage situation. And uh, so in those, look, we don't do a separate trust, but I usually recommend that instead of having it going outright to your new spouse, you can put money in it for a trust for their support, but that way at the end, money goes towards, towards your kids. And whenever I'm with like second marriage people, I have to always address that ugly issue Okay, do you understand that if you give everything to like uh, your new spouse, then she can have a new will done and then leave everything to her third husband. <laughs> and they go, you know, so like, oh, well, I would never get married again. He goes, well, let's see, you weren't planning on number two either, you know. And I always got, I, you know, I got, I got to be blunt and to the point. You know, there's no emotion. I'm like Mr. Spock from old Star Trek. You know, here's the logic to everything. So we don't want to give everything to the new spouse. And, you know, a lot of people went, are, are also vulnerable where, you know, uh, all of a sudden, you know, uh, guys get emails from, uh, um, you know, the woman from the Ukraine or Russia that wants to get married. And then the women get emails from someone that says, oh, yeah, I don't want to get married. The women are lonely. And then the, then the email starts saying, like, oh, I need money to come to the United States so I can marry you. And, um, you know, so... So we want some, that's why sometimes within a will, we create a trust for the spouse so that they just don't go to Atlantic City and goes, okay, I'm gonna put $100,000 on black. I always wanted to do that. Um, it is someone's decision who to leave assets to. The only law is you can't leave the spouse basically penniless. Um, <clears throat> client came in and she said, uh, okay, I, got, uh, I have four children. Um, do I have to treat all my children equally? No, that is your call. What, what's your concern? And she goes, well, one of my kids, we don't really hear from much. He lives on the West Coast. He goes, well, let me ask you a question. On Mother's Day, did you get a call or a card? No. How about on your birthday, a call or a card? No. 
How about a Christmas, a call or a card? No. So he really, of course, is whether they should get anything. Because that's the kind of person that is going to be the biggest pain if you pass away, saying, where's my money? Where's my money? Where's my money? You know, so I said, you don't have to leave them anything. Let's see. Yeah. Um, and we also, we always want to make sure that we're indicating who's going to, if, that, if one beneficiary passes, who gets, the, who gets their share. You can't have anything, you know, unanswered. Um, now, sometimes we also have, in the, uh, some people in the will have what's called specific bequests. What's a specific bequest? A specific bequest says, okay, I leave, um, you know, uh, specific items of value to this particular person. So sometimes, like, uh, you know, uh, mom will say, okay, uh, I want to leave my jewelry to my daughter rather than it just be like my son's the executor because he's going to bring my jewelry and my engagement ring to cash for gold and say, what do you need me for this junk? <laughs> uh, one fellow, uh, he, the purpose of him doing a will, he, had, he was, he was uh, divorced, he had a daughter, but he goes, he goes, I have this musket from the French and Indian War, and uh, our job as the next male in line is to make sure it's passed to another one. So the purpose of doing the will was so that his nephew got the old, rusty, decaying musket that got passed passed down. So, uh, you know, so people have uh, oftentimes have specific requests of money to. Um, a charity, a nonprofit, their church, whoever, whoever they want, just to say, you know, some, uh, you know, something there. Uh, I remember I put, I put in, I wanted some money to go to, uh, you know, St. Thomas Bishop Bar High School boys cross country team because we never got good clothes because all the money went for the football team. <laughs> and we were we had rags. Let's say uh, uh, same thing with my college. Uh, uh, so it is, it is someone's call. But I also say, don't be ridiculous. Um, I asked one lady when I was first starting out in the 1980s, oh, do you have any specific requests? And she was, oh, yes. And it was 11 pages long, single spaced, both sides of the paper. What she had, everything in the house, she had listed who was going to get it. We're not talking about stuff of value. It's like, okay, yeah, this cup is going to go to this person. And she also like, had I got a note under, no one wants it. Most stuff in the house goes towards either um, goodwill, like uh, or 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 garbage can. Most of the stuff, like oh, you got a garage sale guy, you know, I'll give I'll give you a quarter for it. But but it's a collectible. It's only a collectible when you pay money for it. Um, now some people are writing down stuff. Write this down. Self-proving will. Self-proving will. Under the old law, a uh, person uh, signs and there's two witnesses. But then you had to locate one of the two witnesses to appear before the surrogate. And a lot of times that was difficult. My, when my grandma passed, we finally located one of the witnesses. And the lady goes, oh yeah, I used to work in the office. I can be the witness. My fee is $500. My dad goes, $500? I'm not paying you $500. Lady goes, well, get the other witness. Well, she's dead. She goes, yeah, my fee's $500. Now, we could have said, screw you, we're not going to pay you. But then we would have had to go through a much more elaborate uh, procedure that was called, um, you know, a complaint order show cause in front of a judge, which would have taken longer, so we had to pay that amount. So the law was changed for what's called a self-proving will. So that means that the person signs, then there's two witnesses, then the attorney notary, then there's another signature, by the person, two witnesses, and they're turning order in language so that uh, they don't have to locate the witnesses down the road. So typically we save people, just by doing the document, we save people that. Now, beware of uh, cheap I'm things. Sorry. Can you say that again? Uh, so you need two copies of the will? No, 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 no. They sign twice. You're signing twice. So Each will sign uh, twice yeah. the same yeah, you're, It's one will, but if it's your will, you're signing twice, and there's language to make it a self-proving will so that your executor doesn't have to locate who these witnesses are uh, and have them go to court. And I know a law office that they used to advertise, we do wills cheap, we do them for 75 bucks. And someone goes, Kenny, how come you charge like, you know, uh, 400, 300, they charge 75? He goes, well, they do it wrong. 
They do it the old way on purpose. So then when the person dies, you have to go and locate, you know, you have to pay them. <coughs> and I remember running into the son of the guy, uh, the attorney ran the office, he was an attorney also. I said, Willie, your office is going to get in trouble for doing that. That's like a doctor that doesn't do the surgery the whole way through so that then they can bill the, uh, the, uh, the insur medical insurance company again for a second procedure. And I remember him saying, well, uh, if someone wants a self-proving will, we will do it for them. I go, I go, no one in Carteret knows what a self-proving will is. Yeah, the attorneys don't know what a self-proving will is. I'd say, yeah, I'd say, yeah. Who in this room knew what a self-proving will was before four minutes ago? I'd say so. Part of what we do is we try to save people money and try to save aggravation down the road. Now, also, I'd say, I, I mentioned, beware of the cheap things you find online because they're not going to be a self-proving will. And you're right back, it's going to cost you more in the long run. Also, I mentioned, if there's no will, the person who becomes the administrator has to take it apart. Well, uh, the will has to have a clause saying no bond is required. Otherwise, the executor has to pay this thousand dollars or more for a bond. So that's why we make sure that we put that in our documents. Well, on the other hand, if you get some cheap thing online, they're not they're not going to do that. I'd say yeah. I'd say so. Uh, and I remember what. Uh, so typically, what we do is someone comes in, we look at the form, and he goes, "Okay, uh, there's different types of wills. We make some recommendations." And yeah, let's see. Wills are old school. They're a paper document. They're not filed with any type of governmental entity. So what we do is we mail the documents out so that you can read the paper at your home and look at it. Because we all know that if you have paper, you will read it. If you get it on your phone, you will glance at it and you'll come back and say, I'm gonna look at it and I'll, I'll finish reading another day, which you're never gonna do. Let's see, you know, I get, Dozens and dozens of emails every day and some have good articles. Yeah, I'm gonna come back and read it. Have I ever come back and read any of those articles? Have I didn't print them out? Never. Never. Uh, so they, we, we mail the documents out. I call everyone, you know, from my, my hands-free like, phone so that I can talk to everyone and say, okay, did you read the document? Um, you know, do you have it, you know, ahead of time, do you have any questions? I'd say that way I did and make sure that everyone's name is spelled right. Um, I was helping out a lady with her mom's estate and she said, I, you know, I, I should probably do a new will. And she had me look at her will and I go, Terry, I didn't know you were married. She goes, I've never been married. She goes, well, in your will, you're leaving everything to your beloved husband, Roger. She goes, I've never been married. I go, did you read this ahead of time? She goes, she goes, no, I just went to law office and they said, sign here, sign here, sign here. So when people come in on the day of signing, we say, they ask uh, the office asks three questions. Did you read it? Does it contain what you want? Do you have ID to prove who you are? And if someone says, no, I didn't read it, then, w then sometimes we say, then we're coming back another day. Because I can't jeopardize my license for someone who says, I haven't read it. I'd say, and I feel bad, but listen, I gotta do the right thing 100% of the time. Who, who goes to a doctor that says, listen, my policy is I want to do everything right 99% of the time. No. You want the doctor that says, listen, I try to do the best at all times. And yeah, you feel bad. I remember one, at one time the lady said, like, no, I didn't read it. Okay, you're coming back another day. And uh, the daughter was there, and, and she's like, uh, oh, no, no. She misunderstood. She did read it. He goes, no, 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 no. <laughs> we, know, we know what we heard. Let's say uh, she didn't read it. Uh, and it's too, uh, you know, um, it's too complicated to just say, okay, spend two minutes and, you know, because I'd rather have it done, rather have it done right. Now, the original will is your property. You bring the original will home. That's, that's, that's yours. That's, in the old day, I, I shouldn't say the old days. I mean, I'm not that old, but when I first started, we always keep the original wills. You know, you know, because that's the best way we would tell everyone. That's what everyone does. And then the Supreme Court came down with the director and says, no, the will is a client's property, not your property. And the problem was like attorneys would leave and retire, they couldn't find stuff. So um, I remember when they came down with the director, we, we had to call hundreds of people in 2003 to say, hey, we got your original, your original will, come, come. Yeah, I still got original wills because we couldn't locate the people. And it wasn't my, so. 
you get the original. The original will got to be put in a place where the executor can get to it. I see. Um, so a safe deposit box is not a good, uh, oftentimes not a good spot. I'd say uh, uh, because don't assume the executor or executor number two can get to it. I remember my parents put me on, uh, you know, their safe deposit box. My dad gives me the key, and um, you know, one day I says, you know what? I've never been to a safe deposit box. I'm, that's what that's what rich people hide their gold in their Krugerrands. I goes, I'm gonna go to the bank. Well, banks change names and ownerships over time. So what was Common, my touch of Commonwealth becomes First Fidelity, First Union, Countrywide, then eventually Wells Fargo. So I go there, I have my ID, I got the key, he goes, oh no, you're, uh, you, you're, not, on, you're not placed uh, on the uh, box. He goes, no, no, listen, and my father, the engineer, said he came to this bank and filled out papers, I know he did. He's not an old coot that gets lost driving a shop right and uh, he doesn't know where he's going. But the banks, as they get taken over, that's not important paperwork for them to keep. So uh, at least I was lucky. Both my parents are still around. My mom had to drive up from uh, active adult community, go to Metuchen, and you know, and they fill out new papers. But then what? What this shifty bank guy then does? He says, "Oh, okay, you're good. You're on the account. Uh, we got to go over a couple of things with your mom." Okay, good. I'm going to my office. Well, what the shifty bank guy is trying to do is they're trying to sell uh, a seventy-plus-year-old lady a thirty-year annuity. You know, because that's probably what they were getting the commission on that week. I'd say, although we might have been screwing that shifty bank people because my family's long, long lived. My grandfather lived to almost 102. When he was 100 years old, my parents were away some years, so uh, somewhat. Uh, so I was home with my grandfather. I put a, tr a track suit on him, I pinned a number on him, and I had him like shuffle up the street so he could set the world record in a 100-yard dash. Because at the time, there was no record. The maximum record for a 100-yard dash was a 98-year-old. So all I had to do was have him shuffle up the street with the number and have witnesses and time. So, anyway, so anyway, you, uh, the original will you take home. Um, a, copy is no, a copy of the will is as good as a photocopy of your $20 bill you lost. You can't go to the bank and say, listen, I lost my 20, but here's a copy. I need a replacement one. Let's see, uh, uh, if there's only a, a, a photocopy, you have to go through this expensive mechanism in the Superior Court to have the will um, admitted because there's a presumption if the original will is not found that it was destroyed. And again, why go, uh, you know, we want to make things as easy as, 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 as possible for, for people. So, um, now, let's see, before we go, the next topic we're going to touch upon is powers of attorney. Who is, any other questions on wills? So, so where is a good place to put it? Okay, well, the question is, where is a good place to put the will? A lot of people go to, um, you know, uh, Costco and buy one of those fireproof boxes and just put it and just leave it under the bed because there's, aside from dust, most beds have nothing. I would say, because it's not something of value. Someone's looking for bracelets to your house. They're looking for jewelry and stuff like that. I'd say, yeah. Uh, they're not gonna steal a box of papers. It's not like the 1930s where the people had the paper bonds that were worth something. I'd say, uh, you know, the pizza shop owners, they have safe deposit boxes so they can hide the cash, you know, so no one breaks into their house. Uh, but the important thing also is making sure the fireproof box is fireproof. What does that mean? Well, it means that it should be closed shut and, uh, and not have so many papers in it that they're sticking through, like my wife's fireproof box. And if the papers are sticking through, it's not fireproof. That's called kindling. That, that makes the fire better. And uh, my uh, colleagues that are firemen says, a lot of times the damage is not from the fire or the smoke. It's because they're coming with the high-powered hoses to put out the fire. So a lot of times it's water damage. I'd say, uh, so if it's a fireproof box, I'd say it's also waterproof. Uh, oh, uh, where to put it? Not in the basement, okay? Ask, uh, ask anyone who lived uh, in uh, the Jersey Shore area under the bed, I'd say. Well, interesting thing about under the bed. I'd say my wife buys one of those like robotic vacuum cleaners called a Roomba that just goes around the room and it's in a circle and uh, because typically, under the bed never gets vacuumed until the day you are moving. <laughs> and there's 20, 30 years of, of dust and dog hair and cat hair underneath. 
You know, okay. So we got a big yellow lab dog, and we're like, uh, the dog is too big to fit under the bed. Um, but you know, how does the dog have to get under the bed? You know, in that faraway area, the dog's not there. Um, did that answer your question on where to keep stuff? Okay, ma'am, you had a question. I forgot the list. Stuff. Okay, let's see. Oh, wait, wait. When everyone's in my office, I said, listen, write this down. And he goes, I can remember. He goes, no, I don't want you to remember. I, I want you to write this down so that you don't have to remember. Because for example, I write down everything because my mind is for the important things. Like how many home runs Mickey Mantle hit, what place I finished at a running race in high school, and who I beat. The important stuff. Not, you know, you know. You know, ask me what any of my kids' teachers' names in school. If I didn't have it written down, uh, the lady. <laughs> That's all I knew. Okay, okay. Um, everyone got the, uh, if you haven't gotten it, well, I got get the brochure on wills. Okay, the next topic we're going to touch upon is the power of a term. Power of a term. A will takes care of your assets if you pass away. Let's say uh, a power of attorney deals with your assets uh, while you're alive, and typically you're giving the power to someone to uh, make sure your bills are paid and help you out financially, not pay, and not be responsible for you, but make sure everything is taken care of and paid. So, I was with a couple the other day, and I was listen, the power of attorney for the two of you is more important than the will. I said, I said, if, if, if he dies tomorrow, he doesn't have the case, you get everything. Okay? On the other hand, if he gets hurt at work tomorrow and uh, he's in the hospital, you have no legal rights. You can't sign for him, you can't access his bank accounts, and legally the doctor can't even, is not even supposed to talk to you because there's nothing in writing that authorizes the federal law, HIPAA law says the doctor can't disclose anything to someone unless there's something in writing. So, um, so what the power of attorney basically does is we're trying to say, okay, I'd say um, we're picking someone that you know uh, can make sure that my bills are paid. Sometimes it's even to sell real estate. But the important thing is to get it done now. Uh, because um, we often get calls from someone, I gotta get a power of attorney over mom, dad, or uncle Joe. Well, you can't get power of attorney over mom, dad, or uncle Joe. They have to affirmatively come in and give you the power of attorney. Well, they well they can't. Well, then you can't get a power of attorney. They have to do it. Um, and just, so I remember like uh, when I lived in Edison. Um, you know, one of my neighbors called me up. I need. Uh, we're selling the house. We're moving to Carolina, and I need a power of attorney so I can sign for my husband Joe at the close. Okay, why don't you Joe come in? Well, he can. He had a stroke. Well, where is he now? Uh, he's at Roosevelt Care Center. Well. Is he competent now? No, not really. Well, we can't do a document for someone who's not competent. Well, how can we sell the house? He goes, well, uh, as long if he's alive, you would have to go through this lengthy, expensive, uh, and embarrassing uh, procedure called a guardianship, basically asking the Superior Court judge to declare the person incompetent. First, the judge has to appoint a temporary person to interview the person, and it costs a lot of money. It's a minimum of four, four grand, takes uh, you know, a couple months, and it's embarrassing because you have to add, you have to like you know put in front of the public all these embarrassing things that the person you love, you know, uh, you know why they're no longer um, okay. Uh, but it's important to do this now and also do it right. Have an attorney do it. Um, um, some years ago, a lot of the banks were giving people a hard time. And you'd have a perfectly good power attorney, and they would say, oh, but this isn't on our Mid-Atlantic bank form, so you're going to have to have the person sign the special Mid-Atlantic power attorney. Well, it's, they can't anymore. You know, uh, well, then I guess we can't do anything. So the legislature made a law that says, listen, if the power attorney references the New Jersey statute, then the bank has to honor it. But it has to reference uh, section two of PL 1991, C95 colon C46 colon 2B-11. And I'm pretty sure that free stuff you find online or from these companies doesn't have that because they advertise, oh, good in any state, but if it doesn't have that language, well, as far as we say, we're not gonna honor it. Um, now, 
<coughs> a will that's good done in New Jersey is good in any state in the country. Okay? Now, but if you do move to another state, I tell people, once you're, once you're unpacked, sit down with a professional and say, hey, listen, I know it's good, but is this best for me? Uh, because in other states, it might not be the best way to, you know, to um, you know, go through the process. A power of attorney, different states have different rules, so I usually tell people, uh, talk to someone there, will your New Jersey power of attorney be, be recognized there? I also suggest that, you know, uh, you know, if 10 years of you move or your um, the person you have being in your power of attorney has also moved, have a new one because again, you know, these like uh, a lot of times you now you're not calling up the local broker who like used to be on Main Street. You call the 800 number and first you sent their call center in Bangalore, and then you send somewhere else and they goes, oh, I have a power of attorney, and they say, oh well. Can you send it to me? Oh well, this was uh, this is an, and you're trying it. You're you're because if it's an old one, they're gonna say, how do we know that it will, hasn't been uh, you know revoked in the past <coughs> ten years? Um, now the power of attorney says we get power for real estate, um, and we also added something in when the HIPAA law came out. Uh, what the HIPAA law is, um, federal government said, listen, medical records got to be confidential because companies were, you know, their doctors were just letting them go out and to vendors, so they can't disclose it to anyone unless there's something in writing. So we changed our living will forms and our power of attorney forms to also say there's a HIPAA authorization so that um, you're given the power to the person that you trust. Um, can you get more than one POA or do um, you really should only have Well, you want to have person. one person. Just one person. One person and then a second person. Because otherwise, if you got two, that means that two people got to sign for everything. Okay, so one and a backup. Yes. Okay. Yeah, similar to in a, in a will, it's called the executor, and the power of attorney, it's called the personal representative. So usually you have a number one, and then then a number two. I'd say, uh, and the same thing. Like, uh, um, if uh, make sure that the people you have can still be, can still get around. I'd say my grandfather was a smart guy, but when he was 95 years old, he didn't run up the, uh, the steps as fast as he did, but he had to be the ex 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 exec executive number two of his cousin's will because the first person died, and there wasn't anyone else that could easily qualify. So the important thing is you take out whatever documents you have every five or so years, and it goes, okay, is this still what I need, what I want? Uh, just because it's like it's yellow, uh, but and don't don't give away your original uh, documents. You know they can look at a copy. All right. Um, okay. Does anyone else uh, have any questions on power of attorney? Yes, ma'am. There's this thing durable power of attorney for healthcare. Okay, that's that well, we call that we, that's that comes under the living will. So uh, let me touch upon that. Like the purpose of actually that was a good point you brought. Uh, People, I've done, there's two types of, when you sign the uh, power of attorney, it's either effective right away or effective only upon disability. If it's effective right away, then it's durable, meaning that even if you become incompetent, disabled, it's still good. Effect, uh, the other way, it's effective only upon disability. So, um, but there is a, uh, um, a definition under the statute, the doctor has to do a note. Uh, and I usually tell people, listen, if you trust the person, uh, you don't want to go through this whole thing because if you present it to the bank, they might say, well, how do we know this doctor's, you know, note is, is good? But one client did ask me, and he goes, Kenny, he goes, explain it to me in carpenter's terms. You're talking legal terms, durable power of attorney. I'm a carpenter. To explain it in legal Okay, okay. He said, if it's effective right away, uh, you're, you're, your daughter can steal all your money right away. <laughs> if it's effective only upon disability, your daughter got to get a note from the doctor, uh, and then and say you're disabled, and then steal your money. Okay, do you trust you trust your daughter? Yes. Okay. So, one fellow said, uh, "No, nah, I don't really trust anyone." Well, then I guess you know, make it effective only upon disability, but you're making a big process. Process. Okay. Uh, the next topic we're going to touch upon is the uh, living will, advanced directive, medical directive. Uh, um, 
You know, ironically, New Jersey was the first state in the Karen Ann Quinlan case to recognize people's rights to be able to, um, you know, end artificial um, feeding tubes and artificial care. Uh, but it took a while for the legislature to pass the statute. And uh, so we have one in New Jersey. Now, the living will basically, you're saying to uh, your son, yeah, to hospitals and doctors, listen, if I'm in a coma, irreversible condition, I'm not, I can't talk, I can't communicate, um, this is what I want, and really this is what I don't want. And it's very important to have these because I'd say, yeah, if you can, you don't want to put your family in a position of the doctor saying, okay, should today be the day that we remove feeding tubes, there, feeding tubes and life support. I remember a doctor asking me that question one time. And I remember saying, geez, because the person did not have a living will. And I said, geez, doctor, I feel bad. You know, I, I don't really want to say do it. You know, now, you know what the right decision is for someone who's 92 years old that's never going to walk the planet again, it's not going to open up their eyes and, you know, get out of the bed. But you hate to be the one that, okay, yeah, you know, turn this, turn the switch off. Mm -hmm. I couldn't do it for my dog. You know, when they said, okay, let's see, I remember you know, the dog was so sick, you know, cancer, and, we're at the vet's office, and uh, the dog's looking at me, and I'm like, told my wife, no, I can't do it. you got to do it. Because uh, if it was up to me, I'll bring the dog home again. I would say, I can't do it. So, basically, you're doing the living well. Now, uh, I used to say, if I can't run every single day, I want to be put down like they do to racehorses that break their leg. Uh, and the first time, I had missed the day running in like, uh, you know, you know, 15 years, 11 months, every day. So then all of a sudden I have elective surgery and I'm on crutches. And I got this like uh, cement kind of cast thing on my heel. And then he goes, he goes, wait, I, I don't want to be put down right now. I still got a couple more good years left. Don't kill me yet. Um, and I'm right, when we first had it done, um, you know, when you're first married, you're all lovey-dovey and stuff like that. So my wife said, oh, if something happens to you, I can never make the decision to remove life support. I goes, okay, I'll just leave my dad, because he's logical like Mr. Spock. So then fast forward about 25 years in the future, and my wife would say, so wait, get, let me get this right. If you get dead, I get $850,000 tax-free, and I never have to work another day in my life. Uh, yeah. Oh, well, why are we keeping you alive? <laughs> and so I, was, by that time, you know, like, uh, they didn't need me to pick up the kids from, like, you know, uh, you know, soccer practice, wrestling practice, and stuff like that. They, you know. So, yeah, in the Living Will Advanced Directive, uh, there's a section, and um, I put out a brochure on Living Wills, and... So there's no confusion with doctors. We actually use some of the language that the, uh, um, the state has. So deal with fluids and nutrition. Uh, it's either uh, withheld or provided. You're know, talking about feeding tubes. Let's see here. Uh, and so probably 80% of the people now say, listen, there's no hope for me. Uh, no, like, uh, no fluids and nutrition, no feeding tubes. 20% for personal or religious reasons say, you know what? Let's, let's leave the feeding tubes in for a while until the doctor says no. Uh, actually, when I, when I had my first one, I said fluids and nutrition, yes. Because I was in high school wrestling, and I was always sucking weight. And I couldn't eat for days, and I remember what it was like not to have fluids or nutrition. So I says, you know what? I don't want to starve again like I did in high school wrestling. But now he goes, no. Then there's a different section dealing with uh, directed as to medical treatment. And I call it artificial means. And... 99% of people say, hey, there's no hope for me. I don't want uh, any kind of life-sustaining treatment. Uh, but we usually do put in that, uh, you know, pain medication shall be like, uh, administered as appropriate. Uh, so people were elected 20 years ago to do it because they would say, like, uh, uh, my church is opposed to this. And, uh, but if you speak to, like, a, if you, there's no major church that is opposed to living wills. They're opposed to euthanasia, putting people down, let's see. Uh, they're opposed to New Jersey just adopted uh, a right to die statute uh, modeled after Oregon, which, like, uh, um, 
you know, the Oregon says, listen, if someone has, a, has been diagnosed by a doctor, they only have X number of months to live, and they can, then, you, then they can administer, uh, they got, it has to be noticed, and same thing in New Jersey, notice in a waiting uh, you know, period, and then they got to administer it themselves. I'd say, uh, um, you know, and because uh, they don't want people like driving that guy, uh, the parents to Oregon or New Jersey for the weekend to say, you know, uh, you know, uh, okay, drop them off at the, uh, the hospital. Say, okay, listen, um, dad wants to die today. Can you put him down? No, you got to be in the state for six months, and they got to be examined and, and so forth. Um, now, with the uh, now in the, uh, the there was a question dealing with like uh, you know. Um, Directors. So in the living will, you're picking someone to be similar to the, the executor uh, to be the person that is going to be meeting with, uh, uh, talking to doctors. And per, you're, you're picking a number one or number two. And that's important because sometimes we find that the person that was not involved with helping you out and taking care of you, uh, and then you're in the hospital, all of a sudden flies to New Jersey and walks into the hospital room and says, Okay, I'm in charge now, and this is what we're gonna do. Hey, where have you been for the past like a year when we've been driving mom and dad back and forth? So therefore, in the living will, you're picking someone to be your number one and your number two, and that person doesn't have a right to anything. You know, uh, they don't have they don't have a say. Uh, that way, it complies with the HIPAA law. Uh, we also add, we, we recommend everyone sign the organ donor because like. Um, you know, if you're if you're gone and you can help someone else, what what's what's the uh, difficulty? I went to an interesting program put on by the NJ Sharing Network that handles organ donors in New Jersey, and I said, by the way, what's the maximum? At first, I said, what what illnesses bar you from being an organ donor? You know, because to give blood, the list is eight pages long. But he goes, they said at the time, the only illness that bars you from being an organ donor was being uh, HIV. Uh, and I said, okay, uh, what's the maximum age to be an organ donor? And they said, there is no maximum age. I go, well, what's good in an 85-year-old guy? And they said, cornea and skin. I go, well, okay. I mean, listen, if, 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 I was, if I was going blind, I'd rather have an 85-year-old uh, guy eyeballs, you know, cornea, then the crummy ones I have, and if I was in a bad fire, I'd rather have old guy skin than the stuff that was burned off my body. So um, I've always encouraged people to do that because remember, whenever you go into the hospital, they ask you a question. Do you have a living will, yes or no? If yes, can we have, can we have a copy so we can put it on our, in our, in our files? You know, and this way, uh, uh, it also takes some of the, you know, they know it ahead of time. Now, I'm going to touch, uh, the last thing I'm going to touch upon before I bring up uh, uh, my colleague Dan Fabrizio is probate and administration of an estate. In other states, well, there used to be ads in the newspaper about avoid probate, probate is the devil, attend this trust seminar and you get a free meal somewhere. And those were put on by trust salesmen. And they will do this fancy $5,000 trust for you that you don't need. And uh, I remember reading a book one time, it was How to Build a Million Dollar Estate Planning Practice. But basically it was about trying to trick, you know, um, you know people such as yourself into having a $5,000 trust package you don't need. And he goes, you know what, I can't do that because uh, maybe the way I was brought up, you know, but I just couldn't see ripping off, um, you know, my best man Jim Watt's mom doing a $5,000 trust when a $400 will would do just as good for her. Um, you know, so, uh, now, probate in New Jersey is easy. I mentioned bring the original will, that's to you check about $150, and give you the papers. What does the executive gotta do? Well, okay, uh, set up a state account, pay your bills, if there's a house, we sell the house, we put the money in, and then, um, they usually have an informal accounting uh, where you know they just basically showing the checkbook, you know, register, you know, uh, you know, and I tell them my executives, listen, try to send an email or a notice to everyone once a month so they know what's going on, so they don't think they're shenanigans. 
And then uh, once we're ready to distribute the, the monies, we prepare a document that's called the Release Center Funding Bond. And what the Release Center Funding Bond says is, okay, I've gotten the uh, informal accounting, I'm good with what the person does, I want my money, I want my money now. And we mail it out to everyone, and everyone got to sign in front of a notary, get it back, we got to file with the circus office, then everyone gets their checks. Every once in a while, though, you got the person that's the pain, and they don't sign it. So if they don't sign it, we nobody gets their money. It's not that we're holding up their money, nobody gets their money. So typically, I go, we, we'll, we'll send it out, it's like, okay, uh, um, we need it back by October, you know, 19th. And then if we don't get it back by October 19th, because how long does it take for someone to go to a notary in the library or the bank? Not that difficult. We don't get them all back. Uh, there's, a, there's, there's a straggler. We send out a letter a couple days later saying, listen, we got the release of our funding bonds from everyone except for Brother Steve uh, in, in Woodstock. And unless Steve signs this uh, release our funding bond, we can't distribute money to anyone, and we're going to have to go through this expensive process through the Superior Court called a uh, complaint to approve an accounting. It might take nine months, another year, and no one's getting any money until then. It's going to take a lot of money out of the estate. You know, but until uh, but if Steve signs sooner, then everyone will get their money. Uh, by the way, here's Steve's phone number and his address and his email. You go, you go and bother him. That way, people are pounding on the door and screaming, hey, sign the damn thing. Oh, I haven't gotten around. Sometimes people just, I haven't gotten around to. So that's the, uh, let's look. Um, let's see. Uh, uh, in the Christian administration, they signed something called the Digital Fiduciary Act that gives the executors the, uh, the right to um, digital assets. There could be a Facebook accounts, uh, LinkedIn, whatever. But before that, um, these, uh, uh, these companies could say, uh, we can only speak with, like, uh, you know, uh, Steve B, who's a candidate. Well, he died. Well, because, and again, you talked to someone in Bangor War. Uh, we know, uh, no, Steve died. We're the executor. Well, I don't know. We can only speak to Steve B. So uh, it now gives the executor right to contact these companies and, you know, own it or close it down. Because, you know, I have to... And periodically, I have to unfriend people I know I did, you know, uh, but they have a Facebook profile and, uh, you know, um, and, um, you know, and the family can't post on the front, by the way, Steve died in 2016. You know, people can post comments, you know, if the family wants to keep posting comments, by the way, Steve died three years ago, uh, so I just, um, I just unfriend people. Uh, so I... And the topics uh, I touched upon wills. I touched upon revocable trusts or garbage. Uh, they use in other states uh, to avoid probate. Irrevocable trusts are used for Medicaid. We touched upon power of attorney, living wills, uh, probate. Uh, inheritance taxes. Uh, there's only inheritance taxes if it's go not going to blood relatives. Uh, we touched upon Medicaid. Um, and uh, wealth, either welfare, if you have your own money, welfare uh, doesn't pay. Um, we don't need to talk about removing an executive. Um, now, let's see, uh, I, I we typically go for one hour, we went for an hour, but I like to spend uh, 10 more minutes or so because I try to get someone that knows about stuff that I don't know, uh, dealing with financial planning and stuff like that. So I'm asking Dan for Brizzy to come up, and uh, he's from uh, um, New York uh, Life, and talk about common estate planning or financial planning mistakes. I do the estate planning stuff, but a lot of people do dumb stuff. You know, like, uh, you know, if you're seven years old, it probably wouldn't be a good idea to buy a 30 year annuity. I'd say, uh, or like, uh, oh, and before I bring it, make sure a will can't change assets that have direct beneficiaries. So if, uh, if someone put their daughter down for convenience at the bank on that on a, a big account, they get it. A will can't change that. Uh, and, uh, you know, mom always says, well, I'm sure my daughter will do the right thing. goes, of course you do the right thing while you're alive. She's not going to say, like, uh, listen, as soon as you go, I'm screwing Steve and Janet. 
you know, uh, but this way, this, uh, okay, Dan, talk about the uh, mistakes people might make. Wait, before, uh, can you just repeat uh, that statement again? What? A will can't do what? A will can't change assets that have direct beneficiaries. So, um, so if you have, if you have like a, um, a brokerage account, and you have like a, you uh, you have someone down as your as the beneficiary on that brokerage account. A will can't change that. So also, it's a lot of times important that um, if you're not unless you're a million percent sure that who the beneficiary is on brokerage accounts, contact the entity and say, listen, I want a copy of the beneficiary uh, listing there. Let's say yeah. Uh, and don't rely upon what they say over the phone. You want to see it in writing. Uh, lady, lady came in to see us because like, uh, she was involved with a state contest because her father put her down as the beneficiary of of an of, uh, of an account because that's what he wanted. And she filled out the form. The girl, uh, what when he died, the contact the brokerage account. Oh, not there. And she went and brought a claim against the estate in the brokerage account. And she goes, "What do you think?" I goes. I think you got a loser. You got nothing, you know, because someone can show it to you, but unless it's actually filed with that company, you don't get it. You're going, you're going to lose. Um, this lady had uh, um, a lot of a uh, whole bunch of CDs, and CDs were bigger in the 1990s because you were getting, you know, interest on the CDs. So she decided to put different family members on all these different CDs. But and when she did her will, uh, all her estate was going to her like a uh, uh, niece that drove her to like a uh, shop right to go shopping, drove her to doctor's appointments, made sure that she was alive. I'd say uh, you know was, was you know, cared about her. You know, unfortunately, when this lady died, the only thing the niece really got was a headache because there wasn't assets within the estate. Everything had different direct beneficiaries. And again, those are probably the people that didn't send this like uh, this lady a card or like uh, you know contact her for for years. So you got to contact. Um, you know, I I was married for 14 years, and it turns out one of my uh, small life insurance policies still have my dad as the beneficiary. Because I forgot about that one. You know, um, now okay, I'm sure my dad would do the right thing. I'd say, but. I'd say, yeah, um, it's easier just to do everything right ahead of time rather than after the fact. Okay. Okay, Dan, you go. All right. And I'll touch a little bit on CDs. Hello, my name is Dan Fabrizio. Um, I'm an agent with New York Life. I'm also a registered representative with New York Life Securities. I worked on Wall Street for 22 years where institutional investors are my client. Now I'm in Main Street where individuals like yourselves are my client. Um, I'm just going to touch base, I'm not going to take too much time, I know we're running a little over, on some of the basic mistakes as we lead towards, get towards retirement, near retirement or in retirement. Um, one of the most important thing is not planning a retirement with your life expectancy in mind. Um, stop using your parents and your grandparents as your, that's when I'm going to retire or that's how long I'm going to live. Uh, the reality is the expectancies are increasing more. And, um, and even 30 years ago. Uh, the important thing is uh, rely on data and not a hunch, and be careful not to be fooled by actuary estimates. There's nothing deterministic about life expectancies estimates. All right? Another thing is not being smart about claiming Social Security at the right time. Some people are still taking Social Security before the full retirement age, which means you get a smaller check. Um, so apply. For, uh, for Social Security before your retirement age, which most of you are probably 65. Me, I'm born in 62, so that means I'm going to get it at age 67. If you get it earlier than that, after 59 and a half, it's going to be a smaller check. If you can wait, based on your financial resources, um, and everyone is different, generally speaking, if you can take Social Security at a later age, you may receive a larger monthly check for the rest of your life. Again, it depends on everyone's personal circumstances, and if you can wait a few more years to collect Social Security. Um, another item, taking a lump sum from a pension could lead to some expensive mistakes. But thanks to products like annuities, 
It can help retirees meet their retirement goals with guaranteed life, uh, life come, lifetime income streams where the lump sum payment is your only option. If you're able to receive a lifetime income stream from your current pension, that it may be more preferable to use that option. Um, but everything depends on one personal circumstances. Um, another item, uh, when people have their investments, too much risk in your investments as one year to retirement. Obviously, as you get into your retirement, you want to kind of get out of the risky investments in your portfolio if you have a lot of equities in there, particularly around this, this time period now, as you can see, the market is very volatile. Uh, there's a, an old saying where they say, well, as I'm getting your retirement, I want to take 10 years' worth of retirement of what I need to retire and put that more conservatively. So the other piece of that you can be a little bit more risky because it has a little bit more of a timeline to go down and also recover and go up. Um, another item, buying life insurance as an employee benefit. While it's generally less expensive to take group term life coverage with your employer while you're still working, this typically goes away once you leave the company or you retire. Um, and if you're age 50 and older when you retire, it can get very expensive to buy life insurance at that age. One option, is, and obviously the too late option is, is to buy a permanent life insurance policy when you're younger and, and come couple that with your employer's policy. Um, but if you're 50 and older, there are still some whole life insurance products available that depending on your coverage goals, one seeker, it can help enhance your retirement plans. So just keep in mind that because you're 50, there are some items out there. Um, focus in on assets over income. One mistake I've seen is failing to switch your mindset from retirement savings to retirement spending. Um, the main purpose of saving for retirement is so that you have enough money to spend once you're in retirement. Just say if you had $50,000, $500,000 in your IRA, and, but in terms of standard of living, what does that actually mean? Um, based on your spending needs and other income sources, should your assets be allocated once you retire? I mean, can you safely withdraw at 3%? 4%, 5% a year, and still leave, let that last your entire, um, your entire lifetime. Um, it's hard to know what standard of living one can have if all your assets are in one product or account. So again, be conservative and diversify. Uh, some people are just like, well, I'm just leaving it the way it is. I'm retired. It's been good for them. You kind of have to switch that mindset and be a little bit more conservative as you get towards re into retirement. Um, and the last item I just want to touch base on are your bank CDs um, and, and annuities. Older adults, uh, when they retire, they tend to have large lumps of money and they've always had banks and they always had CDs. And they, because the bank recommended it, it's safe. If you've been with the bank a while, that's a common thing. One of the downsides of that, if you're gonna lock your money up in a CD for three years because you get slightly more interest for three years, remember, you're getting a 1099 every year on interest, you have to pay taxes on that. But yet, you can't take that interest out of the bank and spend it. But you're paying tax on something that you can't spend. An option that's available um, are annuities. Annuities are similar in, 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 in concept where you put money aside for a number of years, you get interest, but the big benefit is the interest you're earning is tax deferred, which means you're not getting a 1099 at the end of every year. You can't take the money, so you're not going to get taxed on it. So that's the difference between annuities and CDs. But when you start drawing, you're going to pay the tax. When the, when the annuity, so it's like a CD, when the annuity expires, you can either roll it into another annuity, you can take a little bit out, and whatever little you take out, yes, you will be taxed on whatever you take out. But if you take out this much and you roll over this much, you're only going to be taxed on this much. So you control on what you want uh, to, take, to get taxed on. So that's basically all I have, but it, it, it's just showing you the tax deferral. You're not paying tax on something that you're not able to access, where an annuity is tax deferred. So that's why you can just re roll them over and roll them over. You want to roll them three years in a row, three years, three years, three years. You won't get taxed until it finally take it out, you, you break it. Is there an expiration to an annuity? I Annuities have, just like CDs, they have two, three years, one year, all the way through nine and 10 years. It depends uh, how many, and some people ladder them. They can put so much for three years, so much for six years. So you, there's different options, just like CDs. Um, the only thing is it's all tax deferred. 
So you can play a ladder. If one expires, you can roll it into another one and never get taxed on it until you start drawing on it. Okay? So that's just some of the items I wanted to, just to point out, just to keep in mind as you head into retirement or near retirement. Or, go ahead. I have a question that's actually not retirement related of regarding financials. Uh, I hope so, I can answer it. So my uh, children are younger, they're working age. Um, company matching 401k versus a Roth IRA at this point in their lives. Mm -hmm. Um, which is, in your opinion, more beneficial because the 401k is going to be tax deferred, whereas the Roth right now, obviously, you know, they already pay tax on it. Um, well, if they're starting out in their 401k, mm -hmm. I would stay with that because the employer is matching that. Mm -hmm. So that's giving them that's giving them money. Sure. That's how the 401k grow right. over. And right. Particularly if they're younger, just let it ride in the market. If you're older and you're trying to play catch up, it's probably best to go into a Roth because the tax rates don't seem to be going down. And what tax rate cuts we had recently are going to expire in about five years. Mm -hmm. So um, you've seen some people do what they call Roth conversions now. Um, they're not retirement age yet, but they have a large sum in their 401ks. But when you do a Roth conversion, you're paying the tax now, then it's a Roth. But the thing is, though, we just got a tax, uh, a tax cut recently, um, so it went down a little bit. So people are trying to ride on that 2 or 3% tax cut, and then it's a Roth. And then when you take it out later, it's all tax-free, because when the tax rate expires, the tax rate just going to go back to where it was two years ago, or one year ago, whenever so, it took it back. And, and on that point, for the Roth conversion uh, from a 401k or an IRA into a Roth account, is it beneficial for people who are close to retirement age or right at retirement age to do that conversion? It, it depends. It's everyone's particular circumstances, but because there was this tax cut, there are some tax advisors out there saying, it might be a good idea, you know, if you can afford it, because you're gonna pay hefty tax. If you have four hundred, five hundred thousand dollars in a four one K, you're gonna pay a hefty tax on that. And if you can afford that, you wanna take a haircut, put it in your in your Roth and maybe hopefully all right, you know, with the market a little bit, mm -hmm. then that's fine. But, you know, as you get close to retirement, you want to be invested a little bit more conservative. So in case the market takes a drop, it's, you know, it's not going to pinch you so much. So it really depends on anyone's personal financial circumstances. And if you come into a, a large sum of money, you know, you're inherited, and it's tax-free because, say, it's a, a debt benefit or an insurance proceeds, Hey, you know, I have a little bit of money. Maybe it made sense to do this now, pay the tax. You know, I came into this little bit of wealth. And then later on down the line, I can let that Roth, I could just draw it in one of my retirement along with my Social Security, and my Roth would be tax free. So it depends on various circumstances, though. But, it, but, but for the people that are younger, the company's giving you free money to match your 401k, take it. Someone gives you free money, you're going to take it, right? And that extra money, put in the Roth? Um, if, well, if my wife actually has a Roth because that's just how her employer had set it up. Mm -hmm. um, but if they have extra money, it's, it's, it's already pre-tax, so you're going to do it at a, a, after taxes. Mm -hmm. So you can actually do one on a side if you feel your 401k is not good enough. And, and there's a, um, and some people, when they leave companies, they leave the 401k by the administrator of the old companies. Sometimes it's best to group them all together and just roll them into one mutual fund that's separate from all your prior employers. Right. But it's still a mutual fund. Mm -hmm. And you just have better options um, when you do things like that. So if that's any more questions, uh, you know, by all means. Uh, yeah. And I have one question. Uh, I'm getting up there at age. And uh, if I was to sell my house, what would I do with the money that I get from the sale of that? What would you do with your money if you're going to sell your house? Yes. Well, yeah, obviously you're going to supplement your retirement, right? You're, you're going to need money to live on, right? What do you have if you have a pension and Social Security? Yeah. And, you know, I mean, hopefully you're going to put it into an asset or something where it's going to maybe appreciate in value. Or if you want to supplement, there's a lot of options available, obviously, depending on your financial needs. Um, you can put it into a lifetime income stream annuity and it'll just send you a check for the rest of your life. And you'll never lose your principal amount because if God forbid you pass before you use uh, your proceeds, that goes to a beneficiary, you know, li like a life insurance beneficiary. So it bypasses probate, it goes to whoever it is, but that's on a balance. For example, something similar to that, 
to say you had five hundred thousand dollars from the proceeds. You want a lifetime annuity. You know, I want, I want, you know, a couple thousand dollars a month for the rest of my life. Fine, I had set up. But just say you have to a thousand, hundred thousand dollars, you pass away. That's four hundred thousand that hasn't been used yet. That would go to your beneficiary. So any lifetime income stream does have a beneficiary, similar to a life insurance policy. Does that answer your question? Mm -hmm. That's just one of options, but you know, obviously, there's a lot of things out there. But you know, I can go into far more detail. I, I can't sit here and, and explain yeah. all the products out there. I would be here for hours or maybe days. But anyhow, <laughs> I do have a card out there. Um, any specifics that you want, feel free to, to check it off, put your contact, and just leave it there. And I'll pick it up, and I'll reach out to you later this week or next week, and you know, answer more questions, or if you have more questions about specific products, I'd be more than happy to spend the time with you then. Okay? Thank you, and thanks for coming. So two, uh, two oh. quick things. I always say, like, uh, we can't hang out a while, but if someone wants to come into our, my office instead of us, if they come in the next 30 days instead of us charging the 200 console fee, then we do it as a favor to the uh, library here. Um, and lastly, I assume everyone, everyone signed this paper, right? That they signed. Mm -hmm. I'm gonna put it out, out there, and if, if you're on their list, thank you. Thank you. Thank you.